<laughs> hey, YouTube people, it's us. It's taking it down. It's Donovan. He's going to IKEA. Well, next Saturday. Donovan, as we had attempted to plan logistics just to catch everybody up, Donovan said, "I can't, I can't move it to Saturday. The recording, I have to go to IKEA." And he said it so matter of factly, and it just killed me and Natalie. And honestly, Donovan, it is a great joy to imagine you making a practical IKEA trip. I've done it before. It's All horrible. Right. It is horrible. Do you go it's in with so a mission? Bad. Like you said, you needed shelves specifically. Absolutely. I need bookshelves. That's my mission. But uh, you have to walk the whole thing, right? That's how they get you. Or more specifically, that's how they get my wife. <laughs> Which yeah, is why I'm no longer married. <laughs> so when you go, this is like, how far are you traveling to go to the Ikea? It's about an hour. There's one in New Haven. That's, that's about an hour bad. for me. As the one in New Haven has to be easier than like the one... That everybody in Manhattan goes to, right? Oh, I mean, Lord, it, I can't it, even imagine that. As immortalized in 30 Rock? Yeah, I think so. You know, Lee was talking about having to go to Ikea from when he lived in New York. like Just like you, to get a handful of items that Ikea has the best price on for you know, something you maybe don't want to spend a lot of money on. Or in his case, like how long is he really going to hang on to the stuff that he had when he was in the city? That kind of thing. And they have like a specific bus from Manhattan, like the IKEA bus takes you out. But to Beth get through that kind of, stupid store, your your wife is it's an outing. It's definitely yes, it an is. It's a it's a full day trip, and it's a nightmare. Are you a good sport? I mean, as long as I get my bookshelves. <laughs> do balls. you get? Do you snack? No, absolutely not. That's how they get you. <laughs> they've already got you why would you not eat something while you're there <laughs> and the other thing is sometimes when we're walking through I'm just like how many spatulas do I really need and you know actually uh, last time I went there I bought a lamp and they had like special Ikea brand do I really light bulbs need? right and uh, uh, I was like whatever Ikea I don't need to buy your light bulbs I'll just buy light bulbs at Walmart or whatever well they got me one big light bulb I can screw in, and that's fine. The little light bulb, however, nobody makes it in that size. Uh -huh. But IKEA, I learned my lesson. Uh -huh. I am horrified of what we've grown into. <laughs> Here we are. Remember when we were young and we would do fun things on the weekend, and now we go on special trips to <laughs> IKEA. I was forced hey. into IKEA at a young age. At, at like that was the age. It was terrible. Yeah, my favorite memory of that is uh, you testing every bathroom to see how accurate it was, <laughs> and uh, that all the display books were Jonathan Franzen's Freedom, but in Swedish. That I I may have been overserved at an Atlanta Braves game before going to <laughs> IKEA. I love how you blame the servers. <laughs> Well, the he server was, served himself. The server was me because you could at that time you could take bottles of Coke into okay. into the game, you know. And so I mm. poured most of the Coke out, thinking that everybody might share some of the whiskey, and they didn't. So, well, Jeff, Jeff already had a full Aquafina bottle of coconut rum. <laughs> hey, that, that's a great segue. That's our listener of the week. That's <laughs> they. Hefe, Jeff Hansen, on the road again, Jeff Hansen, the Willie Nelson of our friends. Yeah. Uh, where is Jeff? Dakotas? Coming back from the Dakotas? He was in Kansas City? I never know. It's like when he, he must post his pictures out of chronological order because he'll be in Kansas City and then British Columbia and then New York. I'm like, well, I don't know where the <laughs> hell he is. <laughs> well, and he's also traveling for work, which makes some of his, uh, yeah. his it, it feels like he moves a lot which he does but he does lovely jeff jeff I, I feel like i don't talk to jeff enough because he's been on the road it's his summer and he's he's been traveling good old jeff soaking up uh, the sun soak it soak up the sun guys this is our 165th episode it's kind of hard to believe this when it started truly... oh sorry blaine i was no, just go gonna ahead. say this task truly is sisyphean <laughs> It's never ending. When it started, it was me and random guest for like five or six episodes. And then I think I was like, and then Adam became very regular. 
This is back when Adam was playing music, so I had to get random guests, I think. Because he was in on day one. Back when I was playing music. Oh. With regularity oh. is what I meant. Like on the road. <laughs> oh, man. We All used right. to be a proper musician. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> for, for for listeners and viewers, it'll be viewers for YouTube. For your viewers, when you see Adam's screen go blank, it's because he, he left. He couldn't take any more of this. In a, in a rage. <laughs> there he is. There he is. Just told uh, me just to see me cry. 165th episode. I'm happy. Uh, I've had a lot of fun doing this. I know we don't have the kind of listenership that other podcasts do, but if you listen uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, that's, that's cool of you. Thanks. Um... Not a bad week for TV. We'll get into our usual stuff, uh, our mission. Uh, what we do in the shadows just began its fifth season. <laughs> Donna's already chuckling, and so am it's I. On a, it's on a. It's still on that streak, man. It's on a hot well, streak. Well, we'll talk a little bit. We'll just spend a couple minutes on it. Uh, no real talk on the first two episodes that are already aired. I think they're going to do two a week. Is how I they're going to so. re- release Did they them. do that last year? I feel I like it was so. a very quick season last year. Uh huh. And they churn them out quickly. It's like uh, they'll release one in March, and then by April or June in the next April, May, June the next year, they've got more released. So they can make these fast. Uh, anyway, we won't spoil the first two episodes at all. Donovan, what are you getting from it? Uh, a lot of enjoyment, I suppose. A lot of enjoyment. Uh, part of it is just like here are these characters and actors that I've like they've really establish their quirks so it's like okay it's very fun to see this but also they keep kind of uh it's not like mind-blowing or revolutionary but like uh what they do with colin robinson in the first episode it's a (laughs) complete extension of his his personality but it also is just like this this is a good twist this is a good joke also i'm a i'm an incredible fan of matt barry Yes, uh, and, and, his, he's, and his delivery of everything. He's shining even more these first two episodes. Oh, man, he's hilarious. Yeah. It's a show that hits its marks nearly every episode. They know where to shift their characters. They know where to put them. And they also do this thing that they, they play a very long narrative arc over the course of five seasons about Guillermo. I won't say yes. much about that in case no one's G- watching. Gizmo. It. Gizmo. <laughs> Who's a fun, you know, such a fun... Every one of these characters you... You don't mind being on screen. You know, it's you know, not every, like there's a downer moment. Every once in a while, they'll do a joke that doesn't land or that mm-hmm. goes on too long. I agree. That was whatever. You know, it's not perfect. Nope. But I think that like every, the the overarching uh, trajectory of the episode is always good. I agree. My, I made a note here. It says, it, it feels like they do more than just sitcom shit. And yet less than a dramedy that so many 30-minute shows have turned into. And th- those comedies are also narrative, but it also has some elements of that. It's just, I mean, look, if you want, every episode is 25 minutes or less, mostly. Um, seasons are eight episodes, sometimes ten. Um, it's just funny, like really funny. Uh, and it, at times, like LOL funny, which is kind of hard to get out of me, but... It, it definitely has the uh, the uh, the core of like it's about these vampires who instead of conquering the world live on Staten Island, yeah, and just do the same thing over and over again, but are so awful and self involved they don't care. Yes. <laughs> also, you know, they went to the superb owl with the uh, <laughs> with their neighbor who loves a- slow his best friend. <laughs> don't you think that living for eternity would make you oblivious? Yeah, like you would clueless. be like, oh, these humans, they only live for 200, 300 <laughs> years. Two, 300 years. Poor thing. It's a tragedy. <laughs> I've never found Christian Shaw humorous on her own. Uh, so I'm going to give credit to the writing and the, the people who run the show because she, she, as the guide, is pretty funny. Yeah. She's got some moments, too. So. And, and she's she's definitely, I I like her overall, but like she's struggled and stuff. Like, uh, was it the last season of 30 Rock? Uh, oh, we, oh she, was she just wasn't it? she just wasn't written well in that and it, it just kind of never character. seemed to click yeah never her, seemed to click her own stuff like say the daily show when she was an occasional correspondent just wasn't very funny so that's the example i can pull from anyway if you haven't watched what we do in the shadows just 
wonderful, wonderful comedy, top notch. Maybe it could go down as one of the one of the great comedies. I, you know, like I, I'm not going to say top three, but it, could it be a top ten, top fifteen comedy in in a few years? I, it very well could be. It's that good. A lot of uh, deep jokes or reoccurring <laughs> things, you know, which are that's so fun always. Um, my buddy and um, adjacent Alabama Tate guy Kevin Hallbrook went as Namdor as a uh, Halloween one year, and his I should send you a picture of him as dressed as Namdor. It is spot on. So, uh, anyway, good segue here. Let's get into the show proper. Just a little YouTube stuff to begin. We're in the show proper, and speaking of comedies airing on Hulu and FX. I know it's not a trendy topic anymore, but I wanted to talk about It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. How it's been so long running, and it has sustained its hilarity. If you watch the YouTube version, we just got done talking about what we do in the shadows, which can probably sustain some hilarity depending on how long they want to run. It's Always Sunny, though. I mean, it... it I don't know. I think I've talked in conversation with some people and have labeled it as a top five show ever like a lot of times when you get in those conversations you know you say oh, i'm gonna put twin peaks i'm gonna put deadwood i'm gonna put Mad Men, i'm gonna put the sopranos and you kind of forget comedies but you turn on an episode of it's always sunny in philadelphia and if you're a fan of it you're gonna laugh i mean there's gonna be a moment where you will laugh, maybe three, four, five, six, seven moments, uh, and I'll, I'll open up the floor. Is it the most, because it's been going on for 16 seasons, is it like the most consistent TV show of the modern era, or ever? That That's Cause, what I... Because the that, Simpsons can't keep a streak like Sim this. Simpsons can't. Simpsons are back. Uh, uh, per New York Magazine, there's a, they had a great write-up about how the Simpsons is very, very funny again, and they, uh, they uh, laid out their argument quite well, and, uh, but but it's always sunny is is consistent. It, I wonder it, there, as you're talking. There's only one season that dropped, I think. Yeah, I wondered as you were talking in the fandom, which I'm not really familiar with outside of you know being a fan. But you know, like in the Simpsons world, I know what seasons are favored, and kind of where the fall off is generally considered to be. The, there's really not that with Always Sunny, right? Not really. There is that one, and I can't. Don't don't hold me to this it's the season where um they end up trapped in like this thing that's sinking it's like three seasons ago and it just felt like they didn't have it in them it was still pretty funny though they might have even died or went to hell or almost <laughs> died or something it was something like that and uh, like i said it's been three or four seasons so i've kind of forgotten it was not their greatest moment but it's like they picked up the pieces from that and and decided to just stick with what works. And what works, in my opinion, is they have a secret weapon in Danny DeVito, who is excellent at being a disgusting little troll. <laughs> just like there was what there was just the, an episode that Blaine suggested we watch. I watched from the season. I hadn't started watching the season, so I watched a couple episodes. And one Blaine suggested we watch was what was that episode six? Uh, Risky Rats. Yeah, the gang goes to Risky Rats, or it's just called Risky Rats. And, and there's the just a. It's not even a joke involved with Risky, but it's like Frank is drinking from the water fountain by using like a. <laughs> A paper fry, a paper holder, fry cup, yeah. And a kid For comes no up. Reason. He's like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "Drinking water." What the hell are you doing? And just everything about it. Like Danny DeVito is perfect for that. Yeah. the The thing Killed that me. amazes me with the four of us is Donovan. You were in on the ground floor. Yeah. Like you. How do like you season turn? One. Yeah. How do you tune into that show without much warning or word of mouth happening? What I happened? honestly, I honestly do not remember. It was only like five episodes too, the first season. Yeah, it, it was, was a very fair short. amount of buzz by season two. I feel like word yes. was out by the time it started, but not season one. No, but Frank wasn't even on the show. Around. Right, well, he's on the last episode. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea how it turned on. To that's it. amazing. Uh, go ahead, Adam. It was also. 
a bit like uh, if you if you want to make like a coaching tree for TV shows. You know, there's a lot that goes back to Arrested Development. Mm -hmm. I would argue uh, a lot of a lot of comedies kind of came out of that that style of how it's shot, blah blah blah. Uh, I wasn't when Donovan first turned it on. I don't know that I had like the frame of reference to understand the show. You know, like people would say it's like Seinfeld and then you watch an episode if you've never seen Always Sunny before, you think this is nothing like Seinfeld. And as you continue watching, it starts to make more and more sense that it's kind of set the bar for like how absurd and depraved and insane can we make mainstream comedy. Yeah. I'm impressed that they tackle, especially early and still, they tackle really taboo topics and just they just do not give a shit no and i'm here for that yeah I, a, I remember like i think it's the second or third episode mac and maybe charlie it might be dennis but i think it's mac and charlie because that's usually the pairing uh go to like a <laughs> like an anti-abortion rally so that mac can pick up chicks and he's like yeah. i've got he's like he's like i've got a list of names of abortion doctors and charlie's like why are some crossed out <laughs> <laughs> he's like that way they'll think I already did it <laughs> but they're playing both sides right and they keep trying to oh climb absolutely that <laughs> right. well, that's why I loved like talking about playing both sides right like like there was in this again in this risky rat episode where they any any description of the plot just sounds insane which I love but mm -hmm. when they go to the mannequin and find that it's been defiled uh mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it doesn't have boobs anymore. And and Dennis is like, goddamn libs. And then Charlie's like, oh, but it could be the religious conservatives too. Yes. So yeah, it could. Be. <laughs> that great. encapsulates, yeah, their humor really well. <laughs> I'm going to quote a tweet from Benny Dot Gay. I actually have credit. I have pulled up. I've got credit for this person, and it's perfect. It's it's exactly what we're trying to say, but well said. <laughs> South Park gave an entire generation a particular flavor of brain rot that centers around the idea that taking anything seriously is by definition cringe. Meanwhile, It's Always Sunny showed everyone how horrible people with South Park mentality are in practice. <laughs> That's it. I, I love oh, it. Wow. Yeah. South Park like did not have a great week on, on Twitter. Tell me more. Uh, just a lot of people saying that its ultimate point is to reinforce the status quo. Uh, that anybody that caring about anything is uncool. Uh, and they come from a very libertarian kind of place, uh, fairly conservative, even though, you know, they hide it kind of beneath these gross out jokes or, you know, we'll take on any taboo topic. And it kind of makes it seem like maybe they're more progressive than they are. This is actually mm -hmm. a response to the to the writer and actor strike that's going on, because they, I, I don't know enough of the details to to lay it out, but there's an episode where they're making fun of Canada and they released it during the last strike, uh, and it, it's totally anti union, anti blah blah blah. So interesting. Has yeah. not been a great week for them on progressive social media. Didn't know that. Um, it's always sunny. Some of their better episodes, they don't always have to do this, but like the Risky Rat Pizza and Amusement <laughs> was actually a lot about how kids' culture changes with times and the Ab effects it has on the adults. I love that. Absolutely. I, I really I, loved I'm how... I'm fascinated by that topic. Like, you remember in the 80s when it was like this, and now it's in the 90s, we did this, and now it's like, yeah. I love I that really shit. loved what they did where, like, Everyone in the gang is so like they think the stuff that it happened in Frank's era was horrible, but then they're trying to describe the things in their era and they think it's just fine and normal, you know. When but it's horrible when D's like, you know, mostly ethnic humor, and Frank goes, "Ah, oh, racist stuff." <laughs> <laughs> She's like, "No, no, just like who belongs, who doesn't belong." <laughs> it's just, it's great. It's great. Yeah, they also went from, the from the, the smash paddling. cut. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that the smash cut to uh, Matt uh, yeah. sullenly drinking a juice box in the timeout or the feelings yeah. room or whatever it is. Great. 
Yeah, because they went from paddling to time out to yes. talking about the feelings in time out. <laughs> and, and Max says, where's the shame I'm supposed to be feeling? <laughs> if you don't feel shame, you don't feel bad about yourself. <laughs> you don't hate yourself enough to stop doing the shit. <laughs> That's doing. a good point. That's how I was raised. <laughs> that, that makes sense with where was... I am today. <laughs> um, the scene of with Charlie talking about how monsters should sound perfect f- is just... How monsters should sound is is really great for idiot fanboys who go online to complain about how ridiculous such things are, like having a black Little Mermaid is. I, I loved it when That's he's a, like such correspondence. He, he, he's like try, like the whole character is offensive, and Charlie doesn't get it. And he's like, oh, because you know it was a white guy doing the voice. He's like, oh, exactly. I get it. Representation is important in monsters. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and they, this season, I don't know if you guys have watched uh, how many episodes you've watched, but they've really managed to uh, drop in some of your, the old characters that they use sporadically. And that's just always fun. Uh, yeah. What What is it? The bowling alley one? They've got yes. D's team is like a who's who of weirdos this but what's her name <laughs> artemis is on it artemis <laughs> artemis is on it as well as snail and uh of course the the, the mcpoyle brothers are running the bowling alley <laughs> i mean see just the names make you laugh yeah uh the, they just play with their mythos and it's and it, they do it without being nostalgic which i find mm-hmm. interesting you know that when the mcpoyles are on screen you're not thinking God, this is just a nostalgic drop. You're just, you know, they're just trying to milk it for what was happening 12 years ago. Not really. They're just, they're there in a totally different capacity other than being creepy and weird. <laughs> you, you know, for me, the other standout episode of the three I've seen <laughs> was the one where they try and take Frank's gun from him because he shot everyone. That's and brilliant. it's just. It, the name every, of the episodes are so good too because every everyone time got Frank shot. is just doing something stupid with his gun, it's just like Danger Man. Just it's great. It sells it so so completely. This is a hard ask, but do you? Do any of you have a favorite moment from any episode of the? Because I've got mine. I mean, I'm just curious if you guys have one that just really still makes you laugh. Of like the whole series or yeah. or this season. Yeah, going Oh man, there's so many. Going. You know, honestly, <laughs> there's two that I always think of. One is the the no, actually sorry, three. And they're all cat related. One is the <laughs> Kitten Mittens commercial. Kitten Mittens is an all time great television. Dude. Dude. Me the other worthy. one is when uh they start they like lose a cat in the wall and they keep putting cats in the wall to <laughs> 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 like trying to get the cats out. Yeah, yeah. And 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 then the third would be when uh, uh, Charlie's like t- says to D like walk a mile in my shoes. <laughs> he makes her he makes her stay over at his place. Oh, he's like, all right, like, you gotta you gotta chug a beer and huff glue and eat this cat food really fast. And, and then you got a chemical shit. reaction that makes you feel really sick and really awful and you get really tired and you <laughs> fall right asleep. That, that is, to me, the funniest moment on the that show. Was one of, that was one of mine. Him eating the cat food and then drinking the whiskey or whatever really quickly so he doesn't taste the cat food. Well, Frank <laughs> comes in and does it, right? <laughs> yes, it's without just into bed. <laughs> rolling and holding his stomach. Because there's, uh, there's 50 feral cats outside yowling. <laughs> you, you, don't wanna, you don't even know what that sounds like. <laughs> that... Uh, and it, this season, it, they reveal that there's actually a room behind that. It's just an empty room. Charlie's never used, so they're sleeping together for no reason at all. That reminds me of the uh, when they're fighting. And Frank, he keeps yelling at Frank when they're going to bed. Frank, don't go in the crevice. Don't go in the crevice, Frank. Yes. <laughs> It's like every. It's like this. This show is like word association too, because it just to speak. Thinking about these make me think of my other two favorite moments, which is uh, when Frank poops in the bed, but they're trying to figure out who did it, <laughs> who, who the mystery character came from, <laughs> and then the other one. When... <laughs> I feel like you just summed up why Natalie hasn't talked for the last five years. Yeah, yeah for Natalie. <laughs> Where Dexter We're... is eating cereal in his car, <laughs> and Frank is listening to. <laughs> directions of the Charlie of Charlie on tape and he rear ends Dennis and the gang has a trial 
and it comes <laughs> out that Frank has a certificate specifically saying he doesn't have donkey brains. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and Charlie's just goes lawyer. to the He's hospital. Like, does my, does my, uh, my uh, you, you know, does Dennis have such a certificate? <laughs> Okay, I that does take me now. to my favorite, and I, it still makes me laugh. I saw it, I guess, on Instagram Reels. Someone posted it for some reason, and it's uh, Frank took over a a tourist boat or bus. Was it a boat? Oh yeah, <laughs> of a lot of um, Chinese Japanese people, you know, and and he's just on the radio <laughs> and. He doesn't know what to say. He never has had any social experiences uh, that are appropriate. And he says, uh, what do I like to do? I like banging whores. Uh, <laughs> and it's just like, why would you say that? <laughs> anyway. I think all of mine involve Charlie in some way. Charlie? Charlie yeah. had choices. Mine and involve they... Frank, usually. Frank is a good, I mean, Frank coming out of that sofa that time is. Naked? Yeah, a great yes. phys- moment in physical comedy history. Uh, I can't remember. They're trying to treat Charlie one day, like make a really great day for Charlie. And D is like, I'm going to take you to the spa. And he's never heard the word spa before. So he keeps thinking that she's trying to say spaghetti. <laughs> and so for the rest of the episode, he insists that they go and get spaghetti. And he's just eating to go spaghetti through the rest of the the show. Well, he can't read. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, there's so much to go on. The fact that uh, Mac's dad hates him, but he adores I mean, pick pick any plot. Like, Dennis is probably a serial killer. <laughs> um, I mean, talking about Mac and his art, the, the genius of the show is that you can start, you know, when he gained all that weight on purpose with, oh my, to say, yeah. like, people – intentionally or people not intentionally become better looking the longer they're on tv i'm gonna gain all this weight we'll make jokes about it uh to go from him eating the rum ham with frank that kind of starts that and then the arc ends with his dance thing when he's like shredded again and the, and the, and the dancing, dancing was is genuinely emotionally yes. affecting how does I'm the gl- show pull that off I'm glad you said that. Yeah, the dance thing is worth mentioning because he comes out via the dance to his dad and, and I think to uh, Frank and the others, but they kind of knew it. I mean, I remember Frank being very affected by it. and having yeah, like well, a, There were real human moments there. He brings it up this season, yeah. He talks about, no, I, you know, they, they say Frank... You know, they Frank disparages gay people, and he says, "No, no, no, I'm on board with them, with them since I saw the dance. I understand it now." Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's a nice moment. Natalie, do you have anything redeeming to say about Always Sunny? I feel like this was always <laughs> you you were rolling it? your eyes in the corner. When I, <laughs> I was making it. the. I was running on the assumption that you just don't watch it. I mean, I don't, but it's because I think it's a good show. I think it's funny. I think it's written really well. I think it's clever. I uh-huh. have no problems with the actual stories. Uh-huh. I cannot stand the yelling over each other constantly. Oh. Like, that is such a turnoff that even even if, like, I want to follow a storyline because I like where it's going, I just can't. Like, it's just, it gives me so much anxiety that I have to turn it off and walk away. She is that, an anti-stress TV viewer, as we established we, last week. We know this well about our, our Natalie. To, hey, Natalie, you, you're not the only one to point that out, though. Like I have, that, like that's kind of like a running joke about how if a bunch of people are yelling at the same time, somebody will say this is an always sunny episode. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, interesting. Oh man, I can't get enough of it. I always get so cheerful when it when it uh, revs up a new season. Let's take a break. On the other side of the break, we'll talk about Silo from Apple TV Plus. We will talk about Secret Invasion's most recent episode. Uh, That might be a YouTube special. We'll figure it out. So last week I briefly brought up Silo on Apple TV+. Plus. gave it a meek recommendation at the time. I'd only watched one or two episodes. The show, we're going to spoil for four of the ten episodes, the first four. Be, be forewarned, but before we do, stick around, see if it's for you. 
The show is a science fiction drama TV series, obviously, created by Graham Yost, based on the Wool series. I think I'm getting that right. A series of novels. Wool. I, I think Donovan's nodding, so. I, I've seen it in Barnes & Noble. <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, like I've it, never uh, read it, but I think you got it right. There you go. My next question: Did you? Uh, is it a recent uh, series of books? Recent-ish, right? Well, I say I don't recent. Know. I mean, I, I say that now, and you know, it, it could have been any time within the last fifteen years, I guess. Okay, I'll I can look it up. <laughs> that's, that's recent fine. in book terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah in true. book terms, it can yeah, be. Yeah, fair, like fairly recent. Fairly. Hugh recent. Howie is the no the author of the novels. So set of them apparently the setting is a dystopian future seems to be where community exists in this giant underground silo hence the name i think it's 144 levels um stars rebecca ferguson as juliet she's an engineer who becomes entangled in the mysteries of a murder or two and then like their habitat as well she kind of is trying to piece together what the hell's going on big and small okay uh none of us have familiarity with the books right neither do i didn't even know it was a set of books i just started the show and then you know the end credits tell you based on the books. so we're at least four episodes deep here come spoilers probably uh i think we can all recommend it I, Adam seemed in, in a text message to be kind of digging it. Uh, so I'm going to let Adam and Natalie pick it up from here, just what they're thinking, and then we're going to get spoilers really soon, so just be forewarned. I like a good world-building uh, show. I'm interested in where it goes from... I guess we don't have to get into the spoilers yet, but that's my, my opening compliment. Why I dug it was I enjoyed the world that it was living in and it felt uh like a promising setup you know sometimes you feel a little constrained maybe with something like that where it it could almost be a play you know that's so small uh, but mm -hmm. it, it feels expansive enough as people go up and down the silo the different levels that uh yeah i'm into it and the whatever the mystery is has been kept vague enough yet intriguing enough that can be a frustrating thing you know because like, the question is obviously why are they stuck in here what's it really like outside and they're teasing that enough to keep me in interested i think too in addition to i mean it's a world building it's obviously got some dark themes with murder mystery type of stuff um but it doesn't feel difficult. It it still feels like pretty light, easy to watch, at least to me. I mean, it feels, I told Adam when we watched the first couple of, of episodes, it feels like a very highly produced episode of Doctor Who, which to me yes. is great. Um, it's just, it, it doesn't feel, I guess, just heavy. You know, it's just an enjoyable, still mystery-ish thing, but it's it's entertaining. I'm, I'm into it. This is 100% a setup that a doctor could have accidentally stumbled into. Okay. It's definitely filmed on the Disney World set of Galaxy's Edge, the Star Wars set. And if you've ever visited, it looks a lot like this. Really? Yeah, it does. Dingy, um, very stone, everything built mm -hmm. with like this concrete and stone look. And I mean, old. that may be part of why I'm enjoying it is I just like the aesthetic. It's... It's got an aesthetic. I found in around episode five that the aesthetic gets a little claustrophobic. You start to wish they could go somewhere. And you know, that's not a spoiler in the least, but just I'm curious how they will work around that or if they just don't or they continue to let that be a motif um, because that, that would make sense too. Well, not to the, get into... Can we get into spoilers here? Let's do it. Let's get into spoilers episodes one through four. I think uh, just to make the point about the the potential claustrophobic feelings, when Juliet does go, you know, into the where the original 
drill was and is dangling over the water, the promise of figuring all that out is kind of like the release valve on the claustrophobia to me. Uh-huh. Uh, that there, there's the potential of something outside, of course, but there's also more mystery in the space itself. Uh, and the way that people from different levels talk about the other levels, I mean, there's a sociological component, but it also makes it feel bigger than it probably really is. Yeah, it's huge. It takes like a day or two to get to from top to bottom. Right. I'm all in on the uh, the the drill cavern the the lake whatever's down there it felt very similar to some moments in lodge 49 i don't know really you think of that natalie where uh but that one is almost i mean i love that show and it's on a different level from this one so far but uh that one was like a cosmic portal situation potentially and this this feels a little bit more grounded than that when she gets to that cavern it is breathtaking in its immensity yes and you're right it does contrast the um their habitats and their their apartments that they have to live in donovan it reminds me a bit of a book that you recommended to me piranesi yeah <clears throat> how so well the setup there is someone is in a mysterious place that just seems vast but there are it's it's a it is a different setup but it, it feels a bit how would you describe that donovan it's not subterranean but it's it's uh vast and cavernous and improbable but also the guy chronicling it just records everything so matter-of-factly that it has there's almost that like good dissonance right of, of like how could this be and what is it almost feels like a dreamscape yeah uh, like in that one there are tides in the the area that they're in because there's ocean waves and all this kind of stuff so it's not on that same level but the setup of people being somewhere and not really understanding why but not questioning it that often mm -hmm, mm -hmm. feels similar That's what's, that is definitely what's happening here um there's this per pervasive idea throughout all of the episodes that if you hide information and you're the one that gets to hide it you're the one in power that's a pretty common theme in in literature and shows. I like what they're doing with it. That's really cool. Um, it's done well. It's comfortably complex. I think that's right. I think that's what Natalie was getting at. There's a complexity to it that you makes you want to watch the next episode, but it, you're not like throwing your hands in the air and saying "fuck this," I can't understand what they're doing. There's been a few uh, like just to blatantly spoil the end of episode four mm -hmm. when she gets the file on her deceased boyfriend mm -hmm. and they they treat it like a reveal and we didn't totally understand why that was treated as a reveal like did she learn new information there there are a few things about the way that the bureaucracy inside the silo works that uh make you think of checks and balances or maybe more like a late stage soviet people fighting each other kind of thing yeah oh that's nice uh, that's a good comparison i don't know i don't know that i've fully tracked all of that well that was interesting i'm glad you brought that up the that episode ended and i thought to myself i guess kind of like you did like what an odd place to end an episode because it didn't didn't feel like special hmm. well i think too not this isn't quite what you're saying that that like did we miss something This seems like it's been tr being treated as something really important but we don't know what it is i think there's also been like in the first episode when it's revealed that she clearly when she had her birth control removed and then clearly she didn't have her birth control removed that was so skated over i thought that was very strange like just a giant plot hole that everybody was like okay whatever um i don't know if it, I, it doesn't seem like they're coming back to that Maybe they will, but it just seemed like a very heavy thing for them to just treat so casually. Yeah. Um, I, I was confused about that choice just to not even react to that. Well, it, and that's they, part of the the recurring statement, listen to your wife, right? But it wasn't just, it wasn't just her husband that saw it. I mean, 
I don't know. It was weird. I thought that was a weird choice. Okay, that answers my my question. I was going to say, wasn't it just the sheriff, her husband, who saw it? I mean, she did go into the cafeteria, right? Oh, the okay. Rashida Jones character. But I don't know. If somebody walked in covered in blood who was... And it seems like everybody knows everybody's business and would have known that they were have just failed their third and final attempt at having a kid. So mm-hmm. I could see the community thinking this is a person in emotional distress, maybe mm-hmm. not in sound mind or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she asked to go outside, which is also proof that she might not be sane. Right. But even if it was just her husband... That's beyond listen to your wife. That's she knew it was going to be an issue, so she presented physical proof. Mm-hmm. How does he not just ask somebody like, "Hey, what's this about?" But that, I think I think there's a fear of asking too much. I think yeah. he's scared of judicial. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think that even just, you know, a lot of them see when the power goes out briefly, mm-hmm. the screen changes. Mm-hmm. And nobody really raises a stink, but they all look, and they almost look like they wish they hadn't seen it. That's a question that, that they're going to, they, they seem to have tucked away for now, where I am. I know I'm one episode ahead, but it's not that big of a jump. That they want to tuck away the whole what's going on outside, I think for the betterment of the show, because what they're investigating now is pretty interesting. We'll go ahead and ask the question, the million dollar question of the show. Uh, what do you guys think? Is it, is it okay outside? Uh, is the screen they're looking at in the in the astronaut kind of suit does it project a nicer view so that they will clean in hopes that everybody will see how nice it is? I mean, are, are they pumping them with gas and kills them? What what's your theory on what happens when they go outside? You got plenty of options, you know. Feels too early to have a theory. We know so little. Yeah, I just seen so many message boards after episode one and two just be like, oh, well, the screen that they see in the mask is fake or it's somehow controlled and they're not seeing reality. Once they're out there. Mm Mm-hmm. It's too picture perfect, I will say that. I mean, it is yeah. a bright blue sky. It is really, really green. Well, and it's the, I don't know if when she was watching the screen, um, when she went down to to do her IT work and they were looking at the hard drive, mm-hmm. she you could see the reflection of the, the flying V of the birds flying by, and then, then mm-hmm. that's exactly what they saw when they go out. So it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe that is a projection for them and not for real people like real a, people. a last mercy because they know they're gonna die so they see something beautiful yeah here's some euphoria feel better about your situation the uh, the message board theory is they put the very beautiful nature on that screen in their helmet so that they will want to clean right uh, so they'll be like look it's actually nice out here we're okay come out and they'll clean because they can't hear them uh, there is a possibility that it's pretty desolate and barren out there, but it's also okay to live after 144 years. But right. if you let people go, you lose control over who's in charge. Right. It seems like a lot of people, I mean, regardless of what the truth is, there are people who want power and there are a larger number of people who don't want to exist through a shakeup because shakeups are scary. Uh-huh true uh, let's Is try the to girls uh, the accent distracting to anybody else she drops that accent here and there and then she brings it up again is she irish <laughs> she's Scandinavian. Swedish. yeah right wow i'd never heard of this actress yeah neither i knew yeah she's pretty good big role for her though the classic uh streaming era bait and switch of oh rashida jones is in this program no, mm-hmm. she's not. <laughs> or, or Oscar winner David Oyelowo. Yeah. Or Tim Robbins is in it, and he doesn't show up until, what, episode three? Something like mm-hmm. that? In a bit, in, in, a, in as big a role as, yeah. I like him, uh, and I like him in this role. And you'll see, yeah. you guys will see a little bit more moi in episode five. 
uh, let's map it out just a little. We kind of already have, and then uh, that'll give us a moment to to wind down the conversation here. So the idea here is they're living in a silo. It's 144 stories. Um, at the very bottom's engineering. Mysteriously below that, and only a few people know, is the huge drill. We're talking Empire State Building size drill, maybe that created the place no one hardly knows about it maybe two people you've got david oyelowo as the sheriff his wife's an it lady she goes to help george and george has a disc that might reveal more than anyone would want to know and she finds it out she decides suddenly that we're being lied to my birth control's still in me she cuts it out. She volunteers to go outside because she thinks she can live. She dies, seemingly. And David Oyelowo, after a little while, decides, I'm going to do the same thing as sheriff. I'm going to volunteer to go out because I want to be with my wife. Um, he's he's since hooked up with the engineer, Juliet. And she's shown him the cavern, shown him some relics from way back when. Um that's that's what I've got mapped out so far. What am I missing? Once he's gone, he asked that Juliet become sheriff in his place. He left a note. And so she's going to take up the mantle of sheriff. Sheriff reports to the mayor. Mayor seems to report to judicial. But also have some autonomy. Also has some autonomy to do things like put on parades, uh, make some bigger decisions than that. Pick the sheriff. Pick the sheriff. Where are mayor you? Dies. Okay, that's why was my question. <laughs> yeah, you've seen the mayor die. She had been mayor for forty something years. Everybody loves her, beloved mayor. Um, the guy I forget his name is his name. I forget the actor's name, but the deputy. Mm-hmm. He is so good. Uh, uh, you'll see him in occasional things, usually westerns or. You want Will he, Patton? Will Patton. Yeah. Yeah, you knew him. What 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 do you recognize him from? Uh, well, he actually does a lot of audiobooks. He's very good at it. No way. That makes perfect <laughs> sense. And he was, uh, this confuses me a lot as someone in the generation that was shown Remember the Titans. That's right. At every opportunity. Uh, that's right. He was Coach Yost, and so every time it says Graham Yost on the screen as you know, in the credits or whatever, I get confused because that, Will Patton's not uh-uh. Graham Yost, you know, but he's Donovan, you're going to love this. Head. This is for Donovan. You know how I remember Will Patton the most? Please tell me. He was the villain in the famous Kevin Costner picture, The Postman. <laughs> I always bring up The Postman on this show. No one's seen The Fucking Postman but me. <laughs> I've been warned away from it. He Was, was the Kevin villain Costner in... in Waterworld, too? That was pretty yeah. bad also. Yeah. What is yeah. wrong with him? Uh, uh... I don't know. Bad the, choices. Don't disparage Waterworld. Don't, 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 don't disparage Kevin Costner to me, friend. <laughs> no, uh, Will Patton is also the villainous type character in Outer Range, which came out last year. Josh Brolin huh. show on Amazon Prime. Yeah, he, he was really that. good in it too. Will Patton's just good, man. Anyway, if you uh, ever have an itch to listen to Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams, Will no. Patton will be the voice that guides you through it. No. It's wonderful. I didn't know you were an audiobook guy. I'm usually not. Uh, it, a specific kind of book, nonfiction is fair game, and a specific kind of fiction. And I had read Train Dreams a couple of times, and some buddies were reading it, and it was a short listen. So I'll like listen while I run, about, do that sort of thing. About five minutes. It really is less than uh, less probably third. a couple of hours, something about. like that. Um, man, I had a really good question. It was audiobook related. Audiobooks seem to be more, if you like the narrator, go find what they read rather than if you like the book. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, like, it's a different uh, genre. Andy Circus doing Lord of the Rings is very good. Really? Yeah. Maybe that's how I should digest Lord of the Rings. Maybe so. 
I just can't keep my brain on track of an audio. You know, with a book, you can go. Something pretty. You got to be running or driving or. I have people who just listen to audiobooks all the time. I, I can't really do that. I have to be doing something that could be described as monotonous. You know? Monotonous or brainless. Yeah, I could only do it when I was driving or exercising. And even then, I would still not, you know, just lose focus. Yes, yeah, same here. With a book, you can go back and look at the page you kind of forgot mm -hmm. or two. Yeah. That's the thing. If it's of a certain, it has to be of a certain narrative quality for me to go with an audiobook. I would never have consume train dreams for the first time right via audiobook that's maybe that's what i should do you can consume something i've already read as i reread because i don't reread books that's hmm, interesting you, you know i did uh norwood as an audiobook yeah. when i had to drive more <laughs> it was about six hours narrator was good and i knew all the beats so it made me laugh that, that do was you know who narrated pleasant. it no idea <laughs> oh <laughs> I mean, I guess I could look it up, but I, yeah, Norwood I don't know. by Raz. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. The yeah. Raz of the South. We're going to come to the end of our audio. If you're a podcast listener and you listen to us in some sort of podcast app, thanks. This is technically the end of our show. But if you prefer more, if you like us, if you like hanging out with us, we like hanging out with you. We're going to put our Secret Invasion talk on YouTube. And it'll just be at the end of this. Thanks, everyone. All right. We're going to talk a little secret invasion, and I bet you, Na uh, not Natalie, Adam will dip. Is that what you're doing? I'm going to dip. I'm going to let y'all have it. I have, still haven't seen an episode. Yeah, I've only seen the you first one. You don't want to be spoiled there. <laughs> okay, well, you two guys have a good week. We'll see you guys soon. All right. Bye forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the fourth episode, Secret Invasion, is called Beloved. Uh, I'll just give her a little rundown here, so spoilers. I'm about to say what happens. we got a flashback to 2012. Seems like it's right after the, the Avengers stuff. Nick Fury's in Paris with what's what's his girlfriend at the time, or he's she's about to be. It, it turns out her name's Priscilla, and she becomes his wife, we find out in this episode she's a scroll sleeper agent. Probably. Right? Yeah. Okay. Seems that way. She seems to have been all along. And boy, that is the long game. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, yeah. But she also seems to be fond of Nick Fury in a way. You get the reading of the way she's portraying it. that She, she liked him anyway. She doesn't seem upset about what she had to do. Right. Live this life with... A person. Yeah. The episode cuts to present day and the rest of it takes place in said present day where Fury and Talos are tracking down Gravik. He is now a super scroll and uh, he's got powers that are kind of interesting and cool. This is where, you know, if you've been waiting for your Marvel elements, here you go. Uh, Gravik's going to assassinate the president to start World War Three probably in hopes so that the millions of scrolls who are laying in wait can uh, take advantage of the war and just take over the world and it'll be theirs. Is that what you get from it? Yeah. Okay. Decimate the humans, let them do it themselves. Yeah, the old the classic let them fight. Um similar approach to Ultron kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I got a couple notes, but it was it was a pretty straightforward episode. Uh, are you a, much of a Raymond Carver reader? Uh, no. <laughs> they, that opening scene, they quote Raymond Carver to each other, and I thought, man, that is some sort of choice. It's kind of cool in an intelligent little way, uh, because Raymond Carver's kind of known for these very simple relationship kind of narratives, short stories, where there's something really not good going on underneath but you never know you just get the mm -hmm. vibe and i thought man that's that's fury and his wife at that moment um like raymond carver's married characters often have official often have issues beyond the superficial yeah hmm. um and then they call back quote it i thought that might have been a little bit overkill but i thought mm, still mm, it's good it's pretty pretty good for disney it's not bad for a marvel show and then 
And then you have the Pappy Van Winkle. <laughs> that was weird. That was weird. It's not $5,000 for, for Pappy Van Winkle, is it? I have no idea. I know people pay a lot of money for it. Maybe not from the store, but yeah. resale value. Resale value is probably 5000 That's what I was thinking. I was just wishing they would clarify that because I, I was under the assumption it's like 200 bucks or something. Yeah, I don't know. Our listener, Jeff, listener of the week. He'll know. Hefe, I bet he owns a bottle. Hefe, if you own a bottle, what'd you pay for it? And can I have some? <laughs> and Natalie wants a, a drink. Uh, yeah, apparently it's good. I saw, <laughs> I saw a thing on like uh, Facebook or something. I follow like comicbook.com or something. And they one of their headlines this week was, is Pappy Van Winkle real? And I was like, yeah, it's, it's real. I actually yeah. know that one. Um, yeah. I'm a fan of the acting choices, I'm assuming. We'll give credit to Samuel L. Jackson here rather than the director. He does some really cool code switching when he talks to fake roadie. It's like mm -hmm. other oh, buddies. Mm -hmm. Like they've worked together. They're also two black men that know each other. And it's just like code switch. Yeah. Good choice. So yeah. these smaller details are what you and I were talking about last week that this show's kind of getting right. You know? Yeah. I mean, I can't, can't be mad at it. I don't uh, know it, why I, I've, I've seen so many. I've, this is the one show I've not, I'm not looking at the reviews really. I'm just, because all the headlines I see seem to want to hate it and they seem pr still pretty negative. Mm -hmm. But I honestly think this one is, it's doing the spy thing in a fun way. I'm not mad at it. Yeah. Yep. See, I'm of the opinion that I don't think it's doing spy thing great, but I think it's doing little things nicely. Yeah. 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 That makes will, it all work. I will say the Talos death, assuming he's dead, hit more than the Agent Hill one for me yeah i was pretty upset about that not uh, like emotionally because i'm a robot but just upset not to see uh mendelssohn again yeah that's a that bummer was, that was me i guess because um colby smolders was used very yeah infrequently throughout the whole Marvel thing. So when but you we're working her, with shapeshifters here all these characters <laughs> all the faces can come back very true. Yep, you'll see the actor skin, maybe. Assuming he's dead, uh, there's also a good chance that Rhodey is dead. Because that's a scroll. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I thought about that. I, I was wondering if maybe in the next episode they'll just do like a brief walk by in that hallway where they keep all their doppelgangers. And maybe he'll be up up on the wall. Oh, Still yeah. Still alive, that, but just plugged in. That would keep him alive. I'm for it in a way because I understand uh, realistically you can't keep using the same actors a thousand times. Yeah. Y you got to do something with them. Uh, making them dead makes sense in this scenario. So if Rhodey is, has been killed or if they plan on killing him and he's just going to be a scroll for a little while, that it makes sense to me. Wouldn't he be, you would think though, if, I don't know. Maybe it'll come back, but I, I'm waiting for Scroll Rhodey to take advantage of the fact that he's got all the War Machine stuff. You would right? think so? No, I'm with that you. That seems like some pretty good technology to have if you're trying to start some shit. Yeah. Yeah, pose as War Machine and do something. I was just thinking logistically, are they going to spend that kind of CGI money to have... A well, a war machine flying. I don't know. Sure, it would make but sense. You but you can't. Why would you have used that character if you're not going to take advantage of it? I wish they would. It'd be cool. Um, yeah, Talos's death is how we end the episode. It hit me harder. I, uh, I felt kind of sad. Um, I just think the show's better than than critics gave it credit for. I, I don't. I, I don't think they got. As many episodes as we have when they first reviewed it four weeks ago or five weeks ago. Yeah, maybe so. All right. Well, that's the end of our episode for the week uh, on YouTube. And we're off next week. So 
uh, catch up with us, come back to us, and if you leave a review in Apple, we will recognize it on the air for you, like in audio. How's that sound? Do that for us, and I don't know, we'll have some fun with it. Thanks to Listener of the Week, Hefe, Hefe, what's Pappy Van Winkle cost a man? Let us know. (laughs) Bye, everyone.